We get a lot of inquiries uh, from people coming into the tea room, particularly the senior ladies who have lived in Hobart for many, many years, about this uh, very large photo. And my wife, Willie, and I, under John's recommendation, love this photo because there's so many stories in it. And uh, John is going to tell you all about it. G'day and welcome to Forgotten Tasmania. I'm John Stevenson. I'm excited to finally tell the story of this photo. This is Elizabeth Street showing the Union Bank building on the corner of Collins and what's now Elizabeth Mall. Ever since we put up a giant mural at the tea rooms, more and more stories have been coming out about this photo. We had a lady whose father was the bank manager come in and tell us about it, and we've had tram experts, and then we discovered that gentleman in the front with the suit, he's actually cleaning up after the horses. The bank building was designed by Henry Hunter. The lions above the doorway were carved in 1884 by Richard Patterson, a former convict who was a stonemason. When the building was demolished in 1958, the lions were rescued and sent to Port Arthur, where they were displayed until 1988, when they were restored as a gift from the ANZ Bank and placed at St David's Park, which is where they are now. One of the common stories is that this corner has always been a bank, but there was a pub there before the first bank. The hotel started in 1818, called the New Inn Veranda House. Then in 1820, it was called the Crooked Billet New Inn, and later the Ship Hotel. In 1883, it was traded for Webb's Family Hotel in a deal with the Bank of Van Diemen's Land, and then partially demolished so the bank could build a building that you see in the photograph. Colin Dennison found this ad for the Ship Hotel, run by Wise and Day, and a bit later on, the pub licensee was J.C. Hadley. Apparently Hadley did a deal with the bank and swapped for another hotel site, so the bank could build on this corner. They left him the billiard room, which became a small bar, and eventually the modern ship hotel of today. Hadley went on to run the Orient Hotel in Murray Street, which is now known as Hadley's Hotel. They knocked the old ship hotel down and built the Bank of Van Diemen's Land around 1884. That went broke and was then replaced with the Union Bank, and later on it was the ES and A Bank, and then the A and Z, and now it's the Bank of Heritage Isle. Notice that the level of the land was very different than today. It fell away quite steeply into what's now the mall. I think this was because the rivulet ran back from there. It looks like Elizabeth Street was filled in and the rivulet became an underground waterway. So it occurred to me I really need to unpack this story about a bank going broke because I didn't think banks could go broke, and it really didn't sit well with me. And then I discovered the connection with George Adams, and how he came in to bail out the state's economy when the bank went broke. And that's how we got our first dependency on gambling revenue, which has obvious correlations with the way the state is today. The Bank of Van Diemen's Land started in 1823. Banks weren't regulated then, and there were lots of state-based banks in the time before Federation. They were commercial enterprises, just like any other business. We continued to have Tasmanian-based banks until 1998, when the last one, the Trust Bank, was bought out by the Colonial Bank. The Bank of Van Diemen's Land was said to have lent heavily to investors in the silver mining industry. And then there was a recession. The price of silver dropped and the investors couldn't pay the bank. The administrators came in and the bank had many buildings that it owned, so these were disposed of to recoup some of the losses. It was decided to have a lottery and sell tickets to dispose of the assets, and George Adams was brought in to conduct the lottery. George Adams was born in England in 1839 and came to Australia. He was a gold miner in Queensland and then a publican in New South Wales. In 1875, some of his friends from the Tattersalls Club helped him get his first hotel and he ran sweepstakes on horse races. The first public sweep on the Sydney Cup was in 1881, conducted by Adams. Then in 1892, New South Wales prohibited the delivery of letters containing sweeps, which was a way of restricting gambling. Adams moved to Queensland, but they followed suit with similar laws, and in 1895 he came to Tasmania. The Premier, Mr Braddon, supported the business that Adams had, which was then called Tattersall's Consultations, and the Tasmanian Government passed the Suppression of Public Betting and Gambling Act, which gave Tattersall's a monopoly. In 1897, Tattersall's paid £10,000 for the licence. My researcher, Shane Roberts, has calculated that would be about $1.5 in today's money. Curiously enough, he also discovered that when Premier Braddon died, 
he owned debentures in the Cascade Brewery Company, which would have been worth around 1.2 million today. Given Adams also had a connection to Cascade, and the fact that Adams left money to four other Tasmanian politicians, I don't think the deal would have passed the pub test today. Although we'll never know, because the pubs are closed today. Adams conducts a lottery for the disposal of assets of the bank. The first prize is the bank building, and the second prize is Hadley's Hotel. Other bank properties make up the other prizes. The lottery was not well received, and it was not fully subscribed, so they had 50,000 marbles representing 50,000 bets in a drum to draw the winner. Tattersalls conducted further lotteries, or sweepstakes as they became known. Tattersalls was originally in the Fish Building on Elizabeth Street, and then it moved to 77 Collins Street. They were quite successful and they built buildings with their profits, including the Tasmanian Brewery Company on Warwick and Elizabeth Streets. They built Wellington Chambers, and there's a reference to them building something called Beatty's Property, but I need to find out what that is. There's a book called The Luck of the Draw by Eddie Dean and Trevor Wilson, 2006. I think I need to read that book. After the lottery, the Union Bank acquired the building. The Union Bank had been formed by the merger of the Convict Savings Bank and the Tamar Bank. Later in 1951, the Union Bank merged with the Bank of Australasia to form the ANZ Bank. The ANZ Bank has an interesting history too. They started in 1835 in London under a royal charter and they were called the Bank of Australasia. In 1852, the English, Scottish and Australian Bank started. That became known as the ES&A Bank. And then in 1970, the ES&A, or Asanda as it was called then, merged with the ANZ. The bank building was really quite majestic. I showed the Beatty photo to historian Colin Dennison and asked him about it. That's on the Collins Street side. Building the Australasian Bank. Yeah. I told you we got um, a lady came yeah. in the, the tea rooms and, and her father was the, um, the manager there, so she knows all about the lift to take the wood up to his office. And, uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, um, even in the one, in the bank one, where they're uh, all doing the run the day that uh, it uh, had the announcement on the door, have a look and all the trout's upside outside his door because his door was the one further back up. Because there's two buildings like that, hey, mate? There's one at the corner of Argyle and Collins Street, and also Elizabeth and Collins Street, where they had mansions on the side. Yeah. The one down at Collins Street, when I last went through that, that still had. The uh, um, servants' bells and all that. The manager had a private entrance, which is that last door on the left. His office was heated with a fireplace, and wood for the fireplace was stored in the basement of the bank. There was a trap door on the street, about where that horse and cart is in the photo, and the door could be opened to allow wood to be delivered. Then the wood got to the manager's office with a rope and pulley operated lift. When the Bank of Van Diemen's Land collapsed, the angry public lined up outside the manager's door, as can be seen in this photo. You can also see the notice on the closed bank door, and another in the window. This was a remarkable day in history captured in a photo from Collins' collection. The bank building you can see in the photograph was demolished in 1958 and replaced with another bank building. That one was then demolished only a few years ago and replaced with the Bank of Heritage Isle, which you see in my re-photography.
When I print the photo very large, like the mural at the tea rooms, you can see lots of tiny detail that's never been seen before. We're seeing the names of shops and numbers on trams, street signs and all sorts of things. In the Beattie photo, you can see the newly installed telegraph pole with all its wires. The building on the other corner has an equally long history too. It was the Bank of Australasia, and later MBF, and now it's Dome Cafe. But the building also houses a secret. Today it's the hub and data centre for TPG's pipe networks, which makes up a significant portion of Australia's internet, and it's the third largest after NBN and Telstra. Ron asked me if that building was the original one, just extended, or if it was pulled down. In the Beattie photo you can see it's a tailor's. Cole has photos of the construction of the Bank of Australasia building, but it's not clear if the old building was totally demolished or not. The lines on the floors do look the same. The jury's still out on that one. Perhaps the audience can help. There's so much history in each building along Hobart's Elizabeth Mall. I'll be doing several more episodes on that area, including Cat and Fiddle Arcade. Beatty Studio started in Elizabeth Street on this block, and it was last seen in Cat and Fiddle Arcade, so the area is really close to my heart. There's just so much history wrapped up in this one little corner of Hobart. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We are Tasmanian. These are our stories. This is Forgotten Tasmania. <laughs>